Four years and eight months ago, Richard Denton said to me, I want to do a series called, it was then called Prefaces to Shakespeare. I said, you had me at prefaces. <laughs> um, we wanted to do this right off the bat. It seemed like such an obvious uh, and terrific fit. And in public television, you have to have at least two things, patience and optimism. So we've been patient. We raised the money from such great supporters as Howard and Abby Milstein, Ros Walter, the NEH, and, uh, and all the funders that Neil mentioned, uh, the Polonsky Foundation. But I particularly want to thank Howard and Abby for hosting us tonight at this wonderful event, and Georgette Bennett for creating the event with such care and attention. Please thank, join me in thanking them. Now, I'm going to ask my three colleagues, uh, if I may be so bold, to step up, my three guests to step up, but hold your applause. I'm going to talk about them while they come up. Uh, Trevor, Richard, and Oscar, would you please come up and sit in the seats nearest to me? <laughs> um, whenever somebody says these people need no introduction, <laughs> They then go on to introduce them at considerable length. But if I were to give you half of what's worth saying about these three gentlemen, uh, we would be here all night, and they would never get to speak. So I'm going to try to avoid that. Um, Richard Denton. Oh, they're all in the wrong seats. <laughs> we, do we have a director in the house? <laughs> um, Richard Denton, who is closest to me at present, um, <laughs> is the presiding genius of Shakespeare Uncovered. And I think genius is the word. He's a TV producer and director of immense and varied accomplishment, references on demand. Um, and I'm just not going to say any more than that. It's not necessary. Oscar Eustace, in the middle, is the artistic director of the Public Theatre, of Shakespeare in the Park, and Joe's Pub. He's directed and produced many Shakespeare productions, but also dedicates the public to fostering new talent and new work. The public, like 13, has just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Happy birthday to you and to us. And Sir Trevor Nunn, is a theatre, film, and television director. He was artistic director and chief executive of the Royal Shakespeare Company, director of the National Theatre in London. And I think I would be uh, unlikely to be challenged if I said he's simply the world's most renowned theatrical director. He directed the world premieres of four Tom Stoppard plays, as well as Cats, Starlight Express, Sunset Boulevard, Les Miserables, and The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby. Not too bad. But turning back to television and turning back to 13, Trevor also directed Cats, Oklahoma, and King Lear productions that aired on our own great performances. Perhaps most important, he has, as Neil said, directed 30 of Shakespeare's 37 plays, and he plans to complete the list. I want to hear about that. I'm going to join them now, and I'm going to start with Richard, because it did start with Richard. Richard, did Shakespeare need to be uncovered? Oh, <laughs> you didn't say you were going to start with me. Well, I, I, it was a dream for me to do this because Shakespeare is deeply precious to me, as he appears to be to an awful lot of people here. Um, but I wanted him to be, actually, I, it was mostly I wanted him to be precious to my own children. And I, that's where it all started. Um, and then I realized that I wanted to try and make Shakespeare interesting and um, irresistible to people who might never have heard of him, never seen a Shakespeare play, and actually found the language impossibly difficult to understand, while at the same time making a series of programs that would interest people who actually did know the stuff, but would learn something else, and new things. And that was, that was the task, and I thought it was really worth doing, and I still think it's worth doing, and I want to make a whole load more of them. So please recommend this. Um, uh, and um, yes, so I think, it, I think it always needs introducing to new audiences. I think it's 400 years old, and anyone who pretends that doesn't present difficulties um, is, is not really understanding it. Um, and um, it does present difficulties, and it always needs reintroduction, I think. 
but I, I bow to people who know a great deal more about mm -hmm. that than I do. Uh, I'm merely trying to observe from the sidelines how extraordinarily talented mm -hmm. people do this. Well, Trevor, let me give you that invitation. Talk about the modern audience and the ancient work and how we bring one to the other. Yeah, I mean, um, what I think is so important about this series um, is that it recognizes that a, a Shakespeare play is not a constant thing. Uh, a Shakespeare play changes, changes repeatedly over the centuries, uh, over the ages, because society changes, people change. And consequently, in each age, sometimes in each decade, um, different things within the text become vital, uh, <coughs> become relevant, uh, become something that must be emphasized. And, uh, and therefore, the work, um, Shakespeare's work, repeatedly stays up to date. And, uh, and what this series does, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is to propose that um, when we investigate the, the background of the play, uh, the content of the play, we are also investigating many different possibilities of what the play might be. And, uh, and, and therefore, I, I think in the very best sense, this series uh, is educational. Um, yes, of course, it's, it's entertaining. But um, by revealing and, uh, and, uh, and by uh, investigating, um, the series, uh, uh, especially as far as a young audience is concerned, has that possibility of being inspiring. Yeah. And Let me ask you have, you, have you done multiple productions, successive productions of the same play? I have. With, with different, and found a different angle, a different... Very, very much so. Um, to the, the first production I ever did um, was when I was 17, going on 18. I was very extremely precocious, and I thought it would be a good idea to form a small local theatre company of young people. And I thought we should do a very simple play, first of all, so I chose Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I think the production was just over four hours long, and we had lots of music cues from Wagner. Um, but um, it, was, uh, it was an extremely, extremely youthful version uh, of the play. And and then about 15 years later, I had the opportunity of doing it with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And, uh, and, and it's a production I completely stand by. Very, very sophisticated piece of work with some, some wonderfully intelligent actors. Indeed, Helen Mirren was my Ophelia. Um, and who was uh, your Hamlet? Uh, it was a wonderful actor called Alan Howard, who's been oh, to yes. America a number of times, particularly at BAM. Um, but Alan was in his early 30s, and I've seen so many different productions of Hamlet over the years. And then, just a few years ago, it sort of hit me with, a, with a, a extreme force and urgency that what Shakespeare is talking about in that play is that Hamlet is a student, he's a student at Wittenberg University. Um, his friend, Horatio, is a student. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are students. Laertes is given the speech by his father because he's leaving home to go off to university for the first time. Ophelia is probably no more than 16, 17 years old and, and, and uh, of no experience in the world whatsoever. Actually, the production that I did when I was 17 <laughs> was very, very much closer to the center of things. So. I cast, I did a production at the Old Vic and I cast a young actor pretty much straight out of drama school. I think he was 20 at the time, but he looked like he was 17. An actor called Ben Wishaw. And, ah. um, uh, and, and so. the play sort of transformed all over again. That it was, a, it, it was about a, a, a teenage and a growing up experience that was so incredibly painful. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and 
people felt that the play had, uh, had been given an immensely um, relevant, topical but relevant um, uh, uh, energy. Yeah. Now, Oscar, you, you combine Shakespeare and the classi other classic productions with entirely modern, brand new work. Mm. How, do you, where, how do you see the, 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 the necessity for Shakespeare within the mix of what you decide to stage? Well, listen, one of the things that should be said, and we rarely say it in public, is that the New York Shakespeare Festival, Public Theater, started doing free Shakespeare's in the park. And then in 1967, took over the old Astor Place Library. And our first production was the world premiere of Hair and began doing new work and put those th things together in an unthinkable combination that was only really thought of because Joe Papp and Bernie Gersten had made a little trip to the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh. in the <laughs> which they don't talk about that much, and started to see the power of putting new plays and Shakespeare together. And I think, the, for me, the, the single most important thing about that combination is that when you put Shakespeare on the same stage as you're putting new writers, you are holding up an example of what the theater can be that is uh, inspiring, daunting, intimidating, thrilling all at once. Because what Shakespeare, he, he wasn't just the greatest writer in the history of the English language, he was also the writer who penetrated most deeply to what the theater can do. Because he said that absolute realism is completely consonant with the most elaborate formal invention. Romeo and Juliet meeting each other is the essence of young love at first sight, and of course they need to speak in a sonnet when they do that, because that's the way to express it. Mm. They mm. don't need to speak in ums and ahs and naturalistic speech. Mm. And he understood, in a way that I think is particularly important for our writers and our time, that there is no such thing as a private relationship. And partly he did this because of the specific time he wrote in, and partly he did this because of the nature of his company. He had a certain number of actors to employ. So there's no such thing as a boy and a girl who fall in love and carry out their relationship in the privacy of the psychological space between them. Their parents are always part of it. Their country is always part of it. Their kingdom is always part of it. And that is actually truer than the way that we portray private relationships. We have, because our society is so intent on trying to atomize things and trying to psychologize, make everything a matter between individuals, Shakespeare understood it isn't. You can't understand individual behavior except as part of this larger work. And holding him up as an example to our writers makes a Tony Kushner possible. That's mm -hmm. what he's saying. And it's saying, don't mm -hmm. think small. Think how big this field can go. Think how big your imagination can go. Mm. But I, I was just thinking, the other thing which is, I think, quite extraordinary is that Shakespeare, we often, it's, it's very easy to think of it as sacred text and to think it's 400 years old and it's very difficult. But at the same time, you see very much this man of the theater getting hold of ideas and playing with them and doing things that are just for the pure hell of it. I mean, in, in the comedy series, when we're talking about, uh, um, uh, as you like it, when we have a heroine who is, after all, in his day, played by a boy, who then, because it's convenient for him, for, for the actor who's a, a, a boy, to play a girl who then, for her own safety, dresses up as a boy, who then meets the man she's in love with and says, I tell you what, I'll pretend to be a girl for you. <laughs> now, Shakespeare doesn't have to, he just thinks that is just gonna be so much fun. <laughs> he's, he's just, he's like every theatre person today, he's real showbiz, you know, I'll have a boy play a girl who dresses up as a boy who's gonna act like a girl. That'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> and you really, and the more you look into Shakespeare, the more you find this, like you go back in a, in a time machine to a man sitting in the theater 400 years ago thinking, oh, oh that'll work. Hang on. <laughs> and you really do get that sensation. The more you well, look into it, the more you discover it. Indeed, Shakespeare's company was one of several theater companies operating on the South Bank in London at the same time. Mm. And Shakespeare was a sharer in the company. That is to say, he was an investor <laughs> and, uh, and and they had to make a profit. First of all, they had to have a longer run or a bigger success than the other companies if they were going to keep going. And they got their that they got their income out of uh, what. So um, it, it, 
there's there's something very very practical about mm. Shakespeare's approach. Well, I remember when when Richard first started talking to me about this, he said, you know, think of Shakespeare as a showbiz uh, impresario. He wrote sequels and prequels. He would bring yeah. characters back because the audience loved them. He'd write to order when the queen or the, a noble person said, how about writing about this? He was a very pragmatic mm -hmm. show business professional. But you know, part of what also is inspiring about looking at that professional is slightly different than we have nowadays mm -hmm. because that audience was more economically and class diverse than any mm -hmm. equivalent audience that mm -hmm. you can find in a theater today. And what that meant is that he had to write simultaneously to entertain illiterate groundsfolk and the aristocracy and the Oxford educated. So he had to find a way to write plays that would entertain them all at once. And by in, the, in that odd way, by entertaining them all at once, also reflect back what made them all one people. And in you know Henry the Henry ad is of course the great example of this. And Henry V, you can watch him sort of try to work out what it means to be English and what it means to be a right ruler of the English, and what it means to have these different nationalities that nonetheless are all in. And you can see him working out in front of the very people he's talking about. And that is something that the audience made possible for the artist. And it demanded it from the artist, but also liberated it. And, and one of the scholars in the series, Richard will remind me which one it was, Jonathan maybe, uh, one of the scholars says, there were no daily newspapers. There was no, no coverage. Absolutely. There was certainly no internet, of course. People weren't. People might talk about something that had happened because they'd heard about it in the tavern. But on the stage was where discussions about politics and the possibilities, in particular, um, in our Richard II episode, which is presented by Derek Jacobi towards the end, we hear that the Earl of Essex and his potential coup d'état against Elizabeth was. Kind of uh, was implied in the staging of Richard II. In Richard which the II, King, not as an anonymous, anonymous of Richard the Third. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Shocky. Shocky. That's right. <laughs> so uh, maybe, maybe that's not that the outrage of the film Anonymous is not known to everybody. But it's a it's a film that's trying to prove that William Shakespeare did not write the plays. It was the Earl of Oxford, and um, the proponents of uh, of that notion uh, in, in that film. I think they not only shot themselves in the foot, I think they shot the foot right off. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm embarrassed or proud to say I couldn't actually get through it. I got halfway through it and I thought this was a, I was sure to want to watch this one all the way to the final credits, but no. no. There are histories, there are comedies, there are tragedies. As directors and producers, do, do you ultimately prefer one or other particular category? Richard or Oscar? <clears throat> so, uh, we, we, we divide the plays, indeed, into histories and comedies and tragedies. I'm, I'm not sure that Shakespeare did, or I'm not sure that he did it on every single mm. occasion. I think the publishers of the folio thought that they should make that, that distinction. But on so many occasions, um, you, you, you read a play that won't quite fit into any category, and certainly The Tempest is one of them. I mean, it has very serious ingredients, it has very funny ingredients, um, and, and it won't quite fit uh, in, in, into any of those simple distinctions. Um, obviously, um, histories were very popular, um, and that was all to do with the Elizabethan age and um, uh, the, the the need to investigate the national history in order to proclaim loyally that the Tudors uh, had, uh, had saved the country and united the country. Um, but during the course of writing that history, Shakespeare includes a huge <coughs> amount of comedic material. I mean, Falstaff uh, is the greatest comic character in the, in, in, uh, the canon, if not in literature, um, and um, uh, that the, they are histories, but they're politically dangerous, um, and they contain tragic material. Um, uh, a play like um, Twelfth Night, um, it's it's very very hard to pin down because Shakespeare was almost redefining comedy. <laughs> 
um, there are very broad strokes of comedy in the play, but there are strands in the play too that are about mortality, uh, about the onset of age and, and um, uh, how, how fleeting our youth is and, and um, how, how fleeting the experience of love can be. Um, so that uh, the, the play has several turns of voice. Mm. Um, and, and if you attempt to do it as this is swashbuckling and rollicking and, and, and it's a big laugh from beginning to end, there will be a number of sections of the play that will defeat you or you feel maybe you need to cut or cut down. Mm. Let me ask Oscar what, the same question, but when, when you're thinking about what I mean, this is, in a sense, a question about Shakespeare for Americans, Shakespeare in American accents, and Shakespeare for American audiences. What, what, are, the, what are the things you have to evaluate? Well, not, let me talk about that in a couple of different ways. First, please, uh, reference to the categories. It is something that you said, Trevor, that the, the plays take on the color of different ages and different times, and so much so that they actually slip categories at times. And mm -hmm. we definitely, in the folio, Merchant of Venice is a comedy. And uh, I have to say, it has slipped a category. <laughs> not, not because the words have changed, but because our perception of the reality that Shakespeare unfolds has changed. So a lot of what you try to do, and you know, I'm sure this process is not dissimilar on either side of the Atlantic, is think of what is it in the air right now that a certain Shakespeare play will take and refract. Mm -hmm. So that when Lehman Brothers went under, <clears throat> within a week, we knew that within the next two years, we'd be doing a merchant, and we'd be doing a time of Athens. <laughs> Those were the two great plays that actually took something about money and value. And I think, I suppose that some of you um, have, were lucky enough to see Dan Sullivan's luminescent production of Merchant which at, at that particular moment in the park is simply taking the idea, what if, rather than focusing on the anti-Semitism, which of course is a huge component of Merchant, we just look at the idea that treating <coughs> human beings as a commodity and treating love as a commodity is something that cuts through all the classes and ethnicities of these characters, and that what Shylock is doing is actually simply a cruder version of what Bassanio <coughs> is doing, mm -hmm. and what, how melancholy that makes this entire enterprise, and how much about, and that's a beautiful thing that happens in the light of a, a bubble exploding in the stock market. Just as right now, I don't think it's at all a coincidence that there's two uh, uh, wonderfully received uh, productions of Julius Caesar running in London, because what a time to talk about the complete slipperiness of what political legitimacy is. And that's so much of what Caesar, you, you have this, you can't even quite focus on who the protagonist of Julius Caesar is, because the fight of the play is the fight for who's going to get to be the protagonist of the play, who is going to get to run right, and you think it's Cassius's play, and no, it's Caesar's, no, it's Brutus's, no, wait a minute, it's Mark Antony's, oh, no, it's not. And that slipperiness of what, what does the voice of the people mean? What does popularity mean? Does that actually give you political legitimacy or not? This is a beautiful time around the world to be talking about that and refracting that through Shakespeare. So it's, those are the specific things I think we look for when we try to figure out what, what is it that we want to throw into the maw now. Mm. So the Wonderfully well said. And, and um, the, uh, another example would be Henry V that we were talking about before. Because just after the war, Laurence Olivier made his great film of Henry V. And you could be mistaken for thinking that um, the play was um, the national anthem in five acts. Exactly. I mean, uh, it's, it's completely dedicated to the idea of the English somehow surviving. We few, we happy few. Um, uh, it, was, it was a hymnal to the idea of the survival of the English. By the time that we did the play in the RSC something like 20 years later. And we were all so disturbed because of what was happening in Vietnam. The play emerged as an anti-war play. Mm. That the, there are incidents in the play that are 
horrifying and reflect upon the leadership and are you responsible for doing this to the young people of your country and and uh, you know, what, what, what are the politics? Cause be not just in exactly. all those heads exactly. and arms and legs exactly. chopped mm -hmm. off, rise up at judgment exactly. day. Exactly. And few die well in a battle. Uh, the, so the play had just completely turned on its head in the 20th yes. period. Yes. But the great thing about that, which comes from looking at them, is that it doesn't matter which way you look at it, it is there in the text. Correct. That all these ways of looking at it are there as choices available to you in the text. It isn't that we, we are bringing an anti-war agenda to a play. That agenda is there in the text for you to use if you want to. They're there because Shakespeare is the great humanist, mm. the great humanist of all the ages. It's almost like he invented it in a way. I mean, he, he, he writes about the human condition and he says we are dreadfully flawed as a species. We, we sometimes have to be ashamed of ourselves, but eventually what is special about us as a species is that there is the possibility in us of forgiveness, of generosity. He includes all of these possibilities in, in that, that they emerge somewhere in, in, in each and every one of the plays. Um, he's a humanist. Which is, which is, of course, the, the, you know, you both made reference to the fact he's a man of the theater. The thing we love about this profession, mm -hmm. ultimately, is the plays are written, but they were not written to be read, mm -hmm. written to be performed. So the act of the text encountering the moment of performance was true from the time they were born. Now that moment of performance is just 450 years later, 500 years later. <laughs> it's, but it's still the same act of it's up in the air, we encounter it, and we're making a slightly different truth now because we're seeing it through the prism of our place and our time. And that's what makes the theater mm -hmm. a wonderful art form. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give ourselves the slightly more than five minute warning. We need to be wrapping up in about five minutes. But I'm going to ask Richard first. I know time rushes past. Richard, I know that you plan that we should do more of these. Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I've, already, I've already sort of made a selection for series two. I, I think, when I originally came up with it, I thought you could do the complete works of Shakespeare in 20 films. I mean, preface the complete works here. I'm not even sure that you can in 20. It might be slightly more than 20. <laughs> but, um, I mean, you can, uh, there are ways of, like, we've done Henry IV and Henry V together, which is a bit naughty. Um, uh, and quite difficult uh, to do. Um, but I, I do want to do some more. I really do want to do some more. I think they, and these films prove, I think. I would I'd like to just remind everybody that the, the pieces that you saw from The Tempest were sections cut from a, a, a much longer piece. <laughs> it, it, it looked suddenly a bit confusing, like we made a leap of judgment that, that we were, hadn't justified. But uh, in the director is sitting over there, uh, who directed Nicholas three Stockley. of them, actually. Nicholas Say hello. Stockley, and um, who's Trevor's director. And all of these films have a wonderful line, in it, and I challenge anybody to go through Trevor's film on the Tempest and come out with a dry eye. Uh, it is the most extraordinary journey. All of these films are wonderful journeys, and I think there are plenty more incredible journeys to be made on Shakespeare's plays, and I really so do want to do some more. Yeah. Yeah. To be clear, this, uh, this, this is six episodes. It starts on January 25th with Ethan Hawke on Macbeth and Julie Richardson on As You Like It and Twelfth Night. The following week, is Derek Jacobi on Richard II and Jeremy Irons on The Henrys, all three of them. And the third week uh, is David Tennant on Hamlet and Trevor Nunn on Tempest. And we do relish the opportunity to do more because we'll keep our jobs that way. Um, <laughs> but I have, a, I have a very direct question to ask Oscar, mm. since I have you here mm. in public in front of witnesses. Mm. Will you join us on the next round of, ser of the series and? Pick a play that you'd like to do, or a group of I, plays. I would be absolutely thrilled to do that. And you know, I have to say that it's. Um, uh, uh, I'm delighted that your Howard, your mother, gets to be here, Howard. I, I wish my mother got to be here and see me sitting next to Trevor Nunn, behaving <laughs> as if we're equal experts. <laughs> that would have been a crowning moment in her life. Um, but what is true is that actually that dialogue between American England about Shakespeare has been going on for 300 years. It led to, as many of you know, the largest loss of life in a peacetime riot in American history, directly in front of my theater on Astor Place in the 1840s. 
between the partisans of an English Shakespearean and an American Shakespearean, <coughs> literally in street battle that left 27 dead. Really? So absolutely, the Astor Which Place knows right. the it. Yeah. Exactly, two Shakespearean actors. It's astonishing history. <laughs> but there's a history, and the reason that it's worth talking about is that it's not a question of ownership in the sense of exclusive ownership. The idea that Shakespeare belongs to us as well as to the English is something that's deep in the promise of what Shakespeare is, because his promise is not a nationalistic promise, his promise is human promise. Mm -hmm. And because, as Jonathan Bate says, because there was not a storm in the English Channel in 1588, we are not having a panel here about Lope de Vega uncovered, we are having a panel about <laughs> Shakespeare uncovered. Because it's impossible to separate the triumph of Shakespeare from the triumph of English as the national language. And that as such, it's important at the same time as recognizing everything that is specifically genius about Shakespeare, he is also the means by which our culture has come together across the world and saying, your ability to own Shakespeare is your passport to full citizenship culturally mm -hmm. in the world. And it is full humanity. absolutely important. Mm -hmm. It's what the public theater was founded on, free Shakespeare in the park. The idea it's our job to give that passport to as many people as possible so he belongs to them, well, not just that they get to watch him. I think what he's saying is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and wasn't, wasn't that a terrific audition? <laughs> <laughs> one, one, absolutely wonderful. Now, I have a, I also have a direct question, in fact, two que direct questions for Trevor. Um, you've directed 30 yep. of the 37, so you've got seven to go. Is there one that you just can't wait to get your hands on? And is there one that you think, oh my god, <laughs> I'll have to do it because if I don't do it, no, I, I, I mean, I've done the complete set. I've, I, I've thought a great deal about, about the remaining ones, and I'm, I'm pretty clear and, and able to uh, start work on any of them the moment that somebody gives me an opportunity. Actually, you, you, you were talking about sometimes you can do plays in a clump, and uh, the four plays that I haven't done, which are in a clump, are 106 part one, 106 part three, yeah, yeah, 106 yeah. part three, and Richard the Third. But they really are one big epic one play. Big play. Yeah. Um, and and we're very used to seeing um, isolated productions of Richard the Third, and and then there's a huge amount of reference in Richard the Third that we don't quite understand. Because Richard is the climax to mm. the the first quarter, the and, I, and I would like to do the Shakespeare Uncovered episode whilst he's directing that <laughs> quarter <laughs> of the yeah. plays together because um, it would be perfect. But um, no, I'm 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 very very happy to do um, uh, a particular production with a lot of young people involved of uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona, and in the, I still haven't done my Pericles. Um, I have uh, uh, I've set out to do it on a couple of occasions, but... Um, well, I suggest that yeah. the two of you talk, because wouldn't it be great to see... I know a guy who runs a theatre. <laughs> 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 see the, the Henry VI and Richard III cycle. Um, maybe it could start here and go, move to London rather than the other way around. Um, I w I'm sorry to report that we are out of time. Um, and on the other hand, once we get out of the auditorium, we can mill around outside. Um, and talk further, and I know that many of you want to have the opportunity to do that.